Welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 67, recorded on August 19th, 2018. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. It is really great to be connected to you while you are live down at OddCamp 2018. And we're kicking things off with a story that I bet you heard some buzz about at OddCamp because people are talking about it all over the internet. It's these rumors that Valve is working to make Windows games work on SteamOS. Yeah, unfortunately, all it is is rumors. So we don't know whether it's them using Wine or whether they've written something themselves or exactly how it's going to work. But it seems like a pretty logical step for them to do this in order to boost SteamOS as a platform. Like a few stories recently, this started by people digging on Reddit through SteamDB. And they found a string named String Settings Compat Info where the description reads, quote, Steam will automatically install compatibility tools that allow you to play games from your library that were built for other operating systems, end quote. Yeah, and by other operating systems, they mean Windows. Absolutely. And there's uh, there's also another string in there they found, the Steam Settings Compat Advanced Info, which has a warning in there, which reads, quote, you may select a compatibility tool to use with games that have not been tested or verified to work on this platform. This may not work as expected and can cause issues with your games, including crashes and breaking saved games. That last warning there about crashes and breaking saved games has most of the internet speculating this is some sort of wine compatibility layer? I don't know, Joe. I'm I'm more inclined to think it's more like something like DXVK, which is that DirectX to Vulkan compatibility layer that would only work with Windows Vulkan games. Well, maybe it's both. Maybe the Vulkan games are going to work better than the others, but they're going to at least attempt to support the um, non-Vulkan stuff just to widen the uh, number of titles that they've got available for SteamOS. Well, something tells me we'll be learning more in the near future. These things have a way of just keep coming and leaking, and then they grow, and then eventually we see the complete story. So we'll just keep tracking it. Well, one project that we've been keeping an eye on is Endless OS, and last time we were talking about it, things weren't going too well for them. But now things seem to be looking up, because they are going to be shipping it on some ASUS hardware. This is an interesting partnership indeed. You remember Endless, the GNOME-focused Endless OS, which is based on Debian. It is shipping already on the Asus VivoBook 15 X540NA. That's one of the few products that you can get Endless on. It also has an option for Windows 10, but it sounds like this may be expanding a bit. I did some digging around too, and there's already some support documents up on Asus's website, as well as an introduction to Endless on Asus's website. So it seems really early days, but it could pan out to additional hardware. This seems like a pretty great partnership for them. Oh, definitely. It's pretty modest hardware, isn't it? Two gigabytes of RAM, and we're not talking about i3s and i5s here. We're talking about the the low-cost, low-end machines. But that's kind of what Endless is aimed at anyway, isn't it? So it sort of makes sense to start with that kind of hardware. I could see that. I would be curious to see how GNOME 3 Shell performs on that. Uh, And keep in mind, too, Endless has been heavily tailored to have pretty good functionality offline as well. That's kind of neat in a a laptop of this size you might have in your bag. Maybe you want to break it out while you're on the commute and uh, get some work done. And to have a bunch of stuff like Wikipedia and whatnot available offline might be a, a really nice combination with lightweight, cheap hardware. But we have been burnt by Asus before, haven't we? Remember Zandros uh, with the netbooks, uh, and they, they kind of made this whole market. And then when that didn't pan out, they just got rid of Linux completely and started saying it's better with Windows and stuff. They're saying that still right now on their website, and it's very heavily marketed as a Windows 10 home machine. They do seem to fail to go all in. Like, they don't quite grok that they they need to completely go all in, even if it's just one product, go all in, like Dell did with the XPS 13. Instead, they sort of have this back burner hidden down on their website that they don't really talk about, but you can go get support from Endless Solution. Maybe that grows into something bigger, but when you sort of tend to repeat the mistakes of the past, you tend to get the same results. Well, to be fair, with the XPS 13s, they do also do them with Windows. It's not going quite all in, is it, with Linux? But at least they are making a proper effort, and you get people like Barton coming along and really promoting it and engaging with the community, whereas, yeah, not so much with Azus, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, really to clarify the going all in statement, I just mean a website that I can go to where this product has been end-to-end tested running Linux, and I can see a whole website about the information. Like it's a real product from the company, not something hidden away. That's all they really have to do is keep 
selling the Windows 10 version, keep making a website that talks about all the great features of Windows 10. Also make a website that highlights and features the Ubuntu version or whatever it might be and do the same thing. That's all I'm saying is go all in in a, in a way that's a full product. Yeah, well, it is early days. They're just testing the water. If they sell well, then maybe they will do that. And all we can do is hope, really. I think so. And wouldn't it be really interesting to see if those could get some traction in education? The price point combined with Endless, that could be a really nice document editing machine in high schools or, or even middle schools. So there could be some real potential in education. Well, another potential option for that kind of low-end hardware would be the Trinity desktop. TDE, a continuation originally of KDE3. Now it's it really it's its own project, and they just had a big update. They just shipped version R1-1405. It's their fifth maintenance release of the series, and they've made some nice maintenance improvements, fixed things like AUG playback and some sound server issues, and did some major code base refactoring, they say, and fixed a few memory leaks as well, and added a few features. But that's not really the headline feature here. The headline feature is that a desktop environment that harkens back to KDE 3, the 90s, is still getting updates and seeing releases. I love open source. Well, yeah. But the real headline for me is that I thought that they were pretty much dead because we haven't had a release for nearly two years. Right. And here we are with a new release. So just open source refuses to die. Especially people's favorite desktop environments. I, I am seriously tempted to give it a go. I did make an attempt before the show, but their live CDs haven't been updated yet. So I might kick the tires in a few days once they've updated their live CDs. I just, I got to try it out for nostalgia purposes. Well, I haven't had much time because I've been at Og Camp, obviously, as we mentioned. Um, hence my echoey audio. Sorry about that. Um, but I did have a quick chance to spin up Slacks in a VM last night. And um, after I did an app get dist upgrade on it, because it is Debian based, it did show as being uh, 14.0.5. Uh, but it said that it was from April of this year. So it's all a bit confusing, really. But I don't think it's changed massively in terms of features and stuff. It's um, quite a lot of bug fixes. And there are a few features, but the, the overall aesthetic of it hasn't changed and it did give me kind of fond memories of my early linux days um funnily enough with slacks being this really light distro and i don't know as much as i do really appreciate what the the kde team have done with plasma 5 looking back at kde 3 okay it looks a little bit dated okay it looks a lot dated but functionally it is a great desktop Yeah, you hate to give Microsoft credit, but that start menu, launcher bar, quick icons setup that they kind of refined after Windows 95 over the years and then lost the trail after Windows Vista, um, it is a functional launcher. And if you add that and you put a decent file manager on there and you have good performance in a terminal, you're pretty close to having most people's bases covered. Yeah, and if you look at KDE 4... I think they just added too much bloat to that and it took people a long time to get used to it and I never got used to it. And it was only really when 5 came out that I re-evaluated that situation. Um, I don't know, it's almost like 4 is their Vista type release. I don't know, probably (laughs) uh, kill me for saying that. But 3 was great, but a bit dated. 4, not so much. But now with 5, that just keeps getting better and better. And I don't know, it's it's good to see Trinity. It's a little bit like Mate, isn't it, in a sense? Um, Mate's more modern, of course. Um, but it just goes to show that if you make major changes, some people just will not like those changes and they'll just hang around with um, the old version and fork it and still maintain it. It gives me a lot of hope, actually, for XFCE that maybe I can just keep using that forever. It will never die. I mean, imagine, could you imagine if KDE 3 is still getting some love today, then XFCE is probably good for the rest of your life. Well, with the amount I drink, that won't be too long. LinuxAcademy.com slash Unplugged. It's a platform to learn more about Linux and all the things that runs Linux. Advanced training tools that increase your skills and encourage critical thinking. Full featured training library with servers that you spin up on demand. Interactive guides as you dig in. 
real human being instructors ready to help you, topic experts on the subject, practice exams and quizzes. There's so much to the platform that I encourage you to take advantage of that seven-day free trial. And don't worry if you're busy. They have a course scheduler where you can pick a course in a time frame and they'll help you stick to it. They have a vibrant community that keeps you going. They have a flashcard system that gets forked by that community. So there's a lot happening there. And if you're just trying out Linux Academy, you're not sure yet, check out their YouTube channel, Linux Academy Com on YouTube. They're posting stuff every week now, like several things. Uh, their CEO, Anthony, just posted a new video, as well as another edition of Google Cloud Weekly just went up, and they're doing some Docker beginner training sessions over on their channel, too, all for free. They're just passionate about this kind of stuff. So try them out. Go try out the course scheduler. Maybe the learning path. See a series of course and content that's been planned by an instructor for your specific career track. Try out one of those hands-on labs. It's all available at linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. So let's talk about Richard Hughes again and the LVFS project, Linux Vendor Firmware Service. We've talked about Lenovo joining the project and how great that is, especially for you wanting to buy a ThinkPad soon. But now Richard wants to broaden the scope a little bit and his next target is NVMe drives, SSDs. And he wants people to submit some data about what SSDs are out there so that he knows what to work on. And he's got a post on the GNOME blog uh, with instructions of how to do that. So if you do have an NVMe drive in your machine, then do check out linuxactionnews.com slash 67. And there'll be a link there if you can click through to his blog, uh, run a couple of commands, send him off the data and help with getting some firmware updates for SSDs. I ran the command. It's pretty straightforward. On Ubuntu and Fedora systems, the package you need to install is mvme-cli. And then once you install mvme-cli, you run the commands that Richard outlines, and you basically get back like the manufacturer identification and a model number, at least on my Samsung drives. And uh, I'll send those off to him. That's pretty nice. And he has all the information you'd need on the blog post there. Yeah, and I think this kind of opt-in approach is not going to offend anyone, is it? Because if you don't want to share your data, you just don't run the commands. This isn't something baked into um, any distro or desktop environment. But that does mean he's going to get less data as a result of possibly doing something like putting it into GNOME software or whatever. Yeah, hopefully if he just gets an idea, you know, a snapshot of what the more popular drives out there, it'll, it'll at least tell him where to start working. The Linux kernel developers have been up to some hard work. We've got not one, but two kernel updates in the last week. Yeah, 4.18 and then um, a few point releases. We've got the 4.18.3, which is already out within a week. But this 4.18 kernel is a big one, isn't it? There's a lot of new features in there. Yeah, not only do you get support for the AMD Radeon RX Vega M chips, complete support for the Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B+. We're also getting support for the Qualcomm Snapdragon 845 ARM chip, which is what's found in those new Windows 10 ARM systems. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's all kinds of great things in 4.18, even some improvements to USB Type-C and Thunderbolt. But what do you make of this inclusion of the spec file system encryption support? Yeah, the spec cipher, which has gotten some buzz around it online because the NSA was involved with uh, its creation. This is something that I have to dig more into. You know, I, I do understand why people have a strong reaction, but I think it might be a future deep dive topic. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation, isn't there, that the NSA have got the means to crack this cipher, and that's why they're so keen to push it out into the mainstream. I suppose we don't have to use it, do we, just because it's in the kernel, but I think it's upset quite a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's why it's worthy of the deep dive. Yeah, well, we'll have to get Wes on the case for a TechSnap episode. Well, speaking of TechSnap, we did a complete breakdown of Foreshadow, or that L1 data cache bug, whichever one you like to call it, the terminal fault. Uh, that also got patched this week. Now, just a quick high level, it was discovered that memory present in the L1 cache of an Intel CPU core may be exposed to malicious processes that are executing on the CPU core. This vulnerability is known as L1 Terminal Fault, or L1TF. A local attacker in a guest VM could use this to expose sensitive information from other guest hosts. So it was a big deal for the cloud providers. There's a new kernel update as well that mitigates this. Yet more speculative execution vulnerabilities. I remember when Spectre and Meltdown, the news of that broke, and we said at the time, this is just the tip of the iceberg here. We know there's going to be a lot more of this, and sure enough, here we are. 
I think this is the third or fourth one that has a name. Yeah, if you're on a supported distribution, it is worth upgrading because one of the things we've also discovered is sometimes the initial headline comes out and then people work away at it for a few weeks and they discover other clever ways to exploit those flaws to go after desktop users. So it starts really impacting cloud providers because you have this ability for the guest VM to read data from other guest VMs. That's bad. But given time, researchers and others tend to find ways to go after desktop users. So if you're on a distribution that's getting an update, the Ubuntu's, the Debian's, the CentOS's, the Red Hat's, go, go apply your update. And one of the emails that you definitely don't want to wake up to when you are away at a conference like OGCamp is an unattended upgrades reboot required email. Because, okay, it's normally fine when you reboot. It almost always is. But there's always that feeling yeah. in your stomach like, please come back up, right. please. And so I did it, and thankfully, I was able to go to OGCamp and not spend all day trying to fix it. <laughs> well, good on you. You stayed current, Joe. I'm proud of you. You know, some people might say, oh, that Joe, he never installs his updates. But that right there proves otherwise. You can find out what other things Joe is up to and all the other news and headlines in Linux, free software, and the open source world. Get our show every single week by going to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get our new episodes. And go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And maybe consider supporting our whole effort over here at Jupiter Broadcasting. Head over to patreon.com slash jupitersignal. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Ressington. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later. 